Hello, everyone. You're listening to In Session, a mental health insights and tips podcast with me, Sam Dalton, a licensed professional counselor. First off, welcome and thanks for listening. This is episode one. I am excited about this podcast. I'm also a bit intimidated. When I decided to make a podcast, I did a little bit of research on what mental health podcasts are out there. And there's a lot of good stuff out there already. Um, the The fact that there's so much out there already kind of has me intimidated, or at least did have me intimidated at, at the idea of adding my voice to what's already out there. But the more I kind of thought about the fact that there is a lot to talk about in regards to mental health, I figured, you know, another podcast could definitely add to what I think people need. Um, in, in regards to learning about mental health and skills and tips and things that they can do to, to try to improve, improve themselves and improve their, their mental health. With that being said, um, my ultimate goal with this podcast is to uh, kind of offer a behind the scenes perspective on what it's like for me as a professional counselor to share mental health insights with clients and to, to share kind of what I see as far as what has worked for people in applying um, mental health advice and treatment and uh, some of the slip-ups or pitfalls that people have run into in, in trying to treat their mental health and, and, and trying to improve themselves. All of that, you know, with the goal of, of providing a, a resource for people to try to apply in their own lives and, and improve themselves. Um, hopefully the information that I can provide will be kind of in, in a manageable amount and in an understandable, uh, way. Hopefully I don't get too, too deep or too, um, technical. I I really want to try to keep what we talk about on here, um, just simply applicable to uh, anybody's everyday life. Um, so really, I mean, if you come away from this episode or any future episodes, Um, really, if you come away from one of my episodes with a new skill or perspective, then I feel like I've been successful. So that being said, let's uh, talk about what today's topic is. Kind of going back to what I said a minute ago about coming up with uh, a a mental health podcast, I I racked my brain for topics as far as, you know, what what could I talk about? What could I start with? Um, where mental health is such a vast uh, topic. It's really hard to kind of decide what to begin with. You know, we really could start anywhere. Once I came to that realization, I I thought, you know, it really doesn't matter where I start. But then I I thought a little further. I I sat down and and thought about, um, you know, what I do as a therapist and and who I work with and the, the typical presenting concerns that I end up working with. And I thought about how like anxiety and depression are obviously kind of the big ones. Um, But also I I, I do some work with couples as well. And um, when I thought back to the the years of practice that I've done thus far and and what people have struggled with, there was a theme that kind of permeated or wove its way through um, all of those sessions. And that theme was self-care. Self-care tends to be a topic that just makes me feel like a broken record in therapy sessions. Regardless of people's presenting concerns, I end up talking about self-care. And usually what uh, my spiel is for people is, is this um, concept of five like core self-care activities that if people will implement, they will likely see an improvement in their mood. I think the reason that these are the like five core self-care activities is because they're the five self-care activities that people typically overlook or uh, just don't simply don't do. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to, we're going to go through these five topics, talk about why they're important, talk about how you can implement them, and hopefully you can come away with a renewed motivation to, to try to take care of yourself. Before we get into the five self-care activities, I have to mention or rather offer a disclaimer that even though I'm a licensed therapist, everything you hear in this episode is considered my own opinion and doesn't necessarily constitute professional advice intended to replace therapy. If you want therapy, go talk to a therapist. 
What you'll hear in this episode definitely is great advice, but shouldn't replace professional mental health treatment or even be considered treatment for your own mental health concerns. All right, let's get into these topics. So when I was uh, planning out today's episode, I was trying to decide what the best uh, order to share these five self-care activities. And I realized that there really wasn't a, a meaningful order. These, these activities kind of all intertwine with one another, uh, but ultimately they, they can be done independently of each other as well. And so that's where I feel like there's not really a, a, an order that you have to do these in. So really in no particular order, we're going to go through these five self-care activities, starting with sleep hygiene. You're probably wondering, what is sleep hygiene? That is a, that's a great question. Really, it's a fancy way of just talking about addressing three components of our sleep. The time it takes for us to fall asleep, the quality of sleep that we get, and the amount of time that we sleep. When I uh, talk with clients about uh, their sleep hygiene, uh, those are the three main aspects that I like to cover with them. Are they getting, uh, well, how long does it take them to fall asleep? Do they uh, feel like they get a restful night's sleep? And are they sleeping within the recommended range uh, time frame that's been found to be the best for us? I believe the CDC recommends that adults get anywhere from seven to nine hours of sleep. I think technically it's like seven plus because everybody's a little different as far as how much sleep they need. I think adults typically definitely need bare minimum seven hours of sleep, but oftentimes, you know, we need, uh, we need a bit more than that. Uh, really the rule of thumb that I tell clients is If you're sleeping within that seven to nine hour range and you feel good, then you're probably getting the right amount of sleep. If, if you don't, if you don't feel good, then, then you probably need to sleep a little bit more. That, that seems like some common sense though. In regards to kind of that first point of sleep hygiene though, uh, how long it takes you to fall asleep. That's, that's one of the things I like to explore with clients and kind of start a conversation about what their bedtime routines are. Typically, when I ask people, you know, what do they do before bed? Uh, one of the most common answers is uh, they either spend time on their phones or they spend time watching TV. And that, unfortunately, is probably the least beneficial thing you could do before going to bed. I think a number of uh, health agencies recommend that you don't spend time on screens for like at least an hour prior to going to bed. Uh, I think even the recommendations are to, to go longer than an hour uh, before bed if you can, but at the bare minimum, don't be on your phones, don't be watching TV for an hour before bed. I know that there's studies out there that talk about the effect that blue light has on our rhythms. Uh, you may have heard about like circadian rhythms. Ultimately, that's just our, our brain's kind of cycle that it goes through. And uh, we're very much affected by the light. And when we're spending that time on our phones or watching TV, the blue light that comes through those, it, it kind of messes with those rhythms and, and doesn't give us those natural cues that, hey, you know, the sun's down, there's no light, this is when we need to be sleeping. So really the, the first self-care activity that, that you could do to address your sleep hygiene is to, to shut your phone off. Well, maybe not shut it off, but at least put your phone down. Uh, an hour before you go to bed or turn the TV off an hour before you go to bed. That will help you fall asleep and uh, ideally get a little bit better sleep too. Um, Some other recommendations I give people in kind of preparation for going to bed is looking at other aspects of their sleeping environment. Um, So doing things like changing your lighting, uh, having kind of warmer, warmer colors in your lighting, even dimmer brightness of uh, of your lighting in your room or even your whole house. Again, that will kind of cue your body to to know that, hey, it's, it's time to go to bed. Also, uh, a good routine, having a bedtime. I, I know that you probably, as adults, don't want to hear that, hey, you got to have a bedtime. And, and maybe some of you recognize that you have to, right? You got to get to work in the morning. And, and so you have a bedtime for yourself. But really having that routine of um, kind of going to bed at a consistent time, getting up at a, kiss, at a consistent time every morning, 
that's really going to improve your ability to fall asleep um, in a timely manner each night rather than spending your time tossing and turning, wishing that you could finally fall asleep. Another big issue that people run into uh, regarding uh, falling asleep is caffeine. Uh, It's really important to try to limit your caffeine consumption uh, prior to bed. Um, The longer or the more time prior to bed you can go uh, without caffeine, the better. Um, Obviously, if you're going to have a stimulant just before going to sleep, it's going to be difficult for you to fall asleep. Um, There's a number of people clients I've talked to and people in my personal life who have said, oh yeah, I can, I can drink an energy drink and then fall right asleep. That's uh, not healthy uh, and obviously possible for people, but I would venture to, to say that their quality of sleep uh, isn't as good. Or if anything, their uh, caffeine uh, tolerance is, is pretty high and maybe they need to look at how much caffeine they're consuming. But like I said, uh, the longer you can go prior to going to bed, Uh, without caffeine, the better. Um, Now talking about like quality of sleep. um, I know, I know I've mentioned kind of the environment that you're sleeping in. Uh, That definitely also has an effect on, on your quality of sleep. Um, You know, how often you're waking up in the middle of the night or um, how rested you're feeling in the morning, you know, that all plays into your quality of sleep. One of the big things that I recommend people doing to improve their environment that they sleep in is, uh, the lighting. Um, you know, I've mentioned that the warmer light, um, dimmer, dimmer lights too, prior to going to bed, you know, that keys you, uh, keys your brain into knowing that it's time to go to bed. Um, but using blackout curtains to reduce the amount of light that's coming into your room while you sleep, that's, that's going to help keep you from being disturbed by those outside stimuli, um, and, and help you stay asleep. Another big one is using a sound machine. Now, there's there's great apps out there. Um, I think Calm is probably one of the ones I end up recommending the most uh, because it offers some some free kind of ambient noise or white noise. Um, but even just going on YouTube and, and finding some playlists or whatever that, that play some background noise, some like white noise, when you have that running um, and you get used to it, even using a fan will do this too. Um, but having that that background noise that kind of drowns out anything else that would uh, keep you from uh, sleeping soundly. It's going to drown out those interruptions that that could potentially wake you up. So getting some blackout curtains or using a sound machine or playing a sound uh, some ambient noise on your phone or something those those are going to be great ways to help improve your quality of sleep. Again, to recap uh, the important aspects of sleep hygiene. Uh, you want to have a good, good routine. You want to have a good sleep schedule, have a bedtime for yourself, go to bed the same time every night, pretty consistently, get up at the same time every morning, pretty consistently, make sure you're getting the amount of sleep that you need within that time range of, of seven to nine hours, maybe a little more if you need, but, but typically seven to nine hours is, is normal for adults. And then just having a good routine prior to bed that, uh, cues your brain into knowing that, Hey, it's, it's time to fall asleep. That means uh, putting your phone down, shutting the TV off, maybe not drinking an energy drink or caffeinated sodas uh, a few hours before bed so that you're ready to fall asleep. Now, with all of that being said, you may be asking, okay, well, why does that even matter? Why, why does that affect our mental health? Well, as you probably know, anytime you've had a poor night's sleep, think about how your mood and your patience level has been the next day. Not getting enough sleep is a pretty good indicator that um, you're not going to have a very positive mood the next day. That one I feel like is pretty self-explanatory as far as if you get good sleep, you're going to feel good. Um, You're going to have the energy you need to to get the things done that you want to get done, which, and we'll talk about this some more later on this episode, but ultimately that's going to make you feel better and feel more motivated to accomplish the things you want to do, which in turn is going to improve your mood overall. Something that's interesting is that, uh, disorders, uh, like depressive disorders or anxiety disorders, some of the key diagnostic components is how good your sleep is or what your quality of sleep is. Um, in most depression screening questionnaires, it asks about um, your ability to fall asleep, your ability to stay asleep, um, if you have any um, insomnia or hypersomnia. And um, so getting good sleep 
really is a, an integral part of our mental health, right? Because it, it, if we're not getting good sleep, that could be an indicator that, you know, something else is going on. Self-care suggestion number two is going outside. One of the struggles I have as a mental health professional is trying to discern between what is actually common knowledge and what I think is common knowledge just because I talk about it so much. And I feel like this uh, concept of going outside as a self-care activity is one of those that I, th I think people know when in reality they probably don't. So that's why it made the list of uh, my top five suggestions for self-care activities. Now, there's a lot of science that has looked at kind of, uh, well, that has looked at the connection between our mood and the effects of sunlight and uh, things like vitamin D. And I think there's some interesting stuff uh, in that. Um, some of the research that I was reading recently was talking about that connection between um, depressive and anxiety disorders and vitamin D levels. Um, and we'll get into uh, kind of how that works in a second. But from that research that, that I was looking at, it talks about how uh, there tends to be lower vitamin D levels in people who are experiencing anxiety and depressive disorders. And they found a correlation uh, between um, the increase in symptoms of depressive disorders and anxiety disorders and lower vitamin D levels. Now, uh, if you're not familiar with uh, the, the connection between sunlight and vitamin D, simply put, uh, in order for us to kind of metabolize vitamin D or to, to put it to use, we need sunlight. We need those UV rays from the sun in order to do that. And so that's why, or I guess that's kind of the foundation behind going outside as a suggested self-care activity is you go out, you get the sunlight, that helps get the vitamin D uh, metabolized in your body. And, and thus you can kind of set yourself up to not be at risk for increased uh, depressive symptoms or increased anxiety symptoms. Um, there's also research out there that shows that the being outside, getting that sunlight uh, helps reduce stress which it obviously is, is a good thing. That's, that's going to help improve your mood, right? So obviously it's, it's a good suggestion to go outside. One of the, the things that uh, really keeps people from going outside, I think, is kind of the nature of our society right now. And, and I'm speaking from the perspective of kind of Western culture, right? Um, we spend so much time either in our homes, uh, driving in our cars, or indoors at work, right? That we don't get to naturally spend a lot of time outside unless you're, unless you're benefited by the fact that you, you have a job that, that requires you to work outside. You're probably not running into this issue as much. Um, but for a lot of Americans, we spend a majority of our time indoors, which then, you know, kind of creates that problem where we're not getting enough sunlight. Therefore, we're not feeling as good. Uh, I feel like this is pretty well evidenced by uh, the winter months, um, where I live in Idaho, we have uh, kind of a longer winter and therefore uh, a lot more time that's kind of dark and gloomy and, and whatnot. And, and it really is, uh, you really do feel the effect of, of not getting enough sunlight um, during those months. And uh, it's amazing the difference once the sun comes out, uh, the improvement, at least I've seen the improvement in my mood when, when the sun comes out. But I've definitely seen that in clients as well. Um, you know, they, they start to feel a little bit better. They start to see some of their anxiety or their depression start to reduce a little bit, right? Because of that environmental change. Um, something, uh, that I like to suggest to clients, uh, in order to get outside more is to, is to find a reason to be outside, right? Just, I mean, obviously you could go step out uh, on your front step or whatever and, and be outside for a little bit. Like by all means do that. That's going to be great. Um, but if you can find something that's enjoyable, that's going to get you outside, uh, that all the better, you know, um, doing things like going on a hike or even just going for a walk in the park. Uh, those are going to be great things that you're going to enjoy. It's going to kind of motivate you to want to be outside. And, and, and the more that you enjoy it, obviously the more you're going to want to do it. Um, so even doing things like uh, finding an app, like all trails or something else that can kind of show you where nearby hikes are 
will uh, kind of motivate you to to want to go do something. You know, you go see some sights or see something cool in your area and uh, get yourself outside. All right, suggestion number three: exercise. Going back to what I said a minute ago about um, kind of our Western culture and how much time we spend indoors, the the same is true for how much time we spend sitting. Um, I, Americans spend so much time sitting. Uh, if if you if you don't have a job that requires any sort of like uh, physical movement or manual labor, you're likely spending a majority of your day sitting. Uh, because I mean, if you think about it, you're if you're outside of like a major metropolitan area, you're probably driving to work, so you're sitting in a car. If you're working in an office or you know something similar, you're likely sitting for most of the day while you work, and then you sit in your car on your way home, and then you're at home and you're sitting watching TV if if you don't have much else that you're doing at home, and so there you are spending eighty five ninety percent of your day sitting. Um, we, we as humans weren't really intended to be sitting that long and, and really it's not good for us. We, we need some physical exercise. We need to get moving. Um, there's, there's obviously lots of research out there about the importance of exercise and its effect on like stress relief, um, improving our mood, even your sleep, going back to the sleep suggestion, uh, the more you exercise, the more improved your sleep will be. Um, so, so like I said, all of these suggestions are kind of intertwined. So when I bring up the topic of exercise with clients, I am inevitably met with, uh, reasons why it can't be done barriers that people are running into, uh, the, that they feel like are keeping them from exercising. And that's where I want to kind of address this definition of exercise. You're probably, when, when I mention exercise, probably the immediate uh, image that flashed through your mind was going to the gym or doing an intense like cardio exercise or going for a run or something like that, right? That's not wrong. Those, those are definitely good exercise activities. And if you can do those, great, do those. Um, but I, I want to kind of shift this definition of exercise for people and help people uh, kind of look at it in a way that feels more manageable. Um, a lot of the recommendations uh, out there, again, kind of citing the CDC, is basically the definition they use is move more than you currently do right now. And, and that's really what I feel like uh, people need to adopt in their perspective regarding exercise if they're going to start doing it. It doesn't have to be this huge major change. I'm going to start this new exercise routine and all this stuff. If you can do that, great. But really, if you're, if you're needing to start small, start small. Like it doesn't have to be complicated. And so with clients, I, I always just end up recommending, and this kind of gets two self-care activities at once. I recommend um, going for a walk outside for like five minutes. Most everybody can do that. Barring any sort of like major physical disability that's going to keep you from walking, most people can get up and walk for five minutes. If you can do that, you're going to start to see yourself, um, well, number one, feel a little bit better because you got up and moved. But your motivation to start to exercise is going to increase because you've gotten up and you've done something. Uh, basically, an object in motion stays in motion. And so the moment that you get up and get yourself going, you're going to want to keep going. And then you can kind of build on that and, and ultimately increase the amount of exercise that you're doing. It's really important to start slow if you haven't exercised before um, and just gradually increase your intensity and duration. Otherwise, you're going to end up injured. You're not going to be able to keep exercising and then it just kind of becomes a bigger problem. And so really start small, go for a walk, and at that point you'll be on track to improving your mood through exercise. Okay, suggestion number four. This one I think, uh, uh, again, I feel like is kind of a, a no-brainer, but I, I think a lot of people end up overlooking this one as well. Uh, and it's social connection. Now you're asking, okay, well, what does that mean? Social connection is a self-care activity. Basically, what I'm telling you to do is go socialize. Back to uh, some of the, the things that I treat as a therapist, depression being one of them, one of the uh, most common symptoms 
of depression or one of the maybe side effects, I guess, too, is people end up self-isolating. They want to spend time by themselves for whatever reason, uh, whether it's, you know, they don't feel like people want to be around them or they just don't feel comfortable comfortable being around people or they have social anxiety, whatever it may be, they end up self-isolating. And that, you know, in the moment may seem like, oh, yeah, that's helping helping me. It's, it's keeping me in a safe place and I'm comfortable here. But that actually ends up exacerbating the problem. And so I, I suggest to people, you got to find uh, just that one person that you feel comfortable with and, and reach out to them, talk to them. Uh, ideally, you want to talk to them in person. Um, and by doing that, that's going to kind of help you feel that sense of community. One of the, one of the things I always end up telling clients is that humans are pack animals. We got to have that, that community. And so if you're not getting that social interaction, you're really doing yourself a disservice and, and exacerbating your symptoms if you're not connecting with other people. Uh, there's a lot of great ways that you can connect with people. Um, uh, like I said before, you know, finding one person or maybe a few people that, that you feel comfortable with that, that you can connect with in person. That's great. Spend time with those loved ones, family members, whatever it is. Even doing things like joining clubs or volunteering, uh, doing things like, I don't know, an adult sports league or just something that's going to get you connected with people is going to really improve, uh, improve how you feel and improve your mental health. Um, I mentioned a minute ago uh, about social anxiety and overcoming um, kind of that challenge. It's really important to know that there's people out there that do care about you and do want what's best for you. And so, again, if you can find that that one person that, that you feel, feel comfortable with, definitely reach out to that person. Another big uh, pitfall that people run into is thinking that social media counts as socializing. I'm going to tell you right now that that is not the case. Social media does not really count as quality socialization. Um, really, all social media is is platforms for uh, other companies to flash their advertisements at us, intermingled with um, images and videos of people we know, um, all in an effort just to sell us things, right? Like, it's not actually socialization. So, uh, put the phones down get off social media, talk to a friend in person, at the very least, talk to him on the phone, but really talk to him in person and you'll see your mood improve. All right, we're to our final topic, our final self-care suggestion, and that is to eat healthy. Again, there's a lot of studies out there that talk about um, or that uh, have looked into the connection between our mood and our diet and uh, really the the... Uh, summary of all of those, at least the ones that I've reviewed, is that the more healthy and the more uh, whole or less processed food that we eat, the better that we're going to feel. There is a whole like sub, I don't even know what you'd call it, like whole sub genre or rabbit hole, I guess you could go down that uh, looks into the connection between like your, your gut health what's going on in your stomach and the connection that that has with your brain and your psyche and your mental health. Um, really interesting stuff. Maybe we'll do an episode in the future about it, but um, ultimately the summary is the, the healthier you eat, the more whole food, the less processed you eat, the better you're going to feel. I think uh, a lot of people kind of shy away from this topic, shy away from this as a self care activity. Again, Speaking from the American culture, we have a bad relationship with processed food. And it's, it's actually kind of hard to, to find uh, good foods that are minimally processed. But it is definitely worth it. You definitely feel better the better you eat. Um, really, I mean, you just follow the USDA guidelines as far as the amount of fruits and vegetables, whole grains, lean proteins that you're eating. Uh, really just following those, making sure that you're getting a well-balanced diet, the better you're going to feel. Um, one of the things that I've seen help me, and, and I've seen some clients too that have really improved how they felt by doing this, is focusing on like meal prepping. Because that's the other thing. We are so busy 
that it is really hard to want to cook food at the end of the day, right? Or to um, have a breakfast made in the morning rather than, you know, hitting up fast food on the way to work or whatever it is. Um, So meal prepping is a great way to kind of uh, set yourself up for success in eating healthy. Uh, I've heard of people doing it where, you know, they cook all their uh, lunches or whatever for the week or their lunches and breakfasts for the week um, on a Sunday. And then uh, they have it ready so that it's just kind of a grab and go. They have their lunch, they have their breakfast, whatever. And then you can just focus on your dinners in the evenings. Um, But even some people, you know, they'll meal prep their dinners or kind of batch cook or whatever it is. But ultimately, if you can set yourself up for success by doing that, uh, you'll find you will have improved your mood significantly. Um, One of the other things that people tend to run into that I think really affects how they feel about themselves is overeating. Um, again, Americans and our bad relationship with food, um, overeating is, is a major problem. And, and I don't know, we could go into kind of the systemic issues and, uh, whatnot that, that play into that. But ultimately, if you can focus on doing, um, kind of two things, some intuitive eating and mindful eating, and just kind of getting into those briefly, intuitive eating is, paying attention to what your body is feeling and and what it's telling you you need. Um, If you're feeling thirsty, drink water. Don't drink soda. Um, If you're feeling hungry, try to eat a food that is going to be filling but isn't, you know, packed in um, super processed sugars or, or things like that. And then when you are eating, pay attention to what you're eating. Enjoy the food. Savor it. You know, pay attention to how it feels. Pay attention to what it tastes like and, and really enjoy what you're eating. Uh, that's going to slow you down, which ultimately is going to give yourself time to feel full and ideally not overeat. Uh, for me, nothing feels worse than when I've overeaten and feel just so bloated and just kind of feel disgusting, right? Even if I've eaten good food, if I've eaten too much of it, you just end up feeling bad. So uh, focus on your eating. Try to eat healthy, and uh, you'll definitely see your mood improve. So, in summary, we're here at the end. These these have been five things that I have seen people really neglect. That once they've started to do, they will uh, they've improved their their mental health. Um, so, just to kind of review, we we need to improve our sleep hygiene. Try to um, improve uh, what you do to go to bed so that you can fall asleep quickly. Um, improve the environment that you're sleeping in so you can sleep well. And then um, make sure that you're getting the right amount of sleep, you know, not sleeping too much and not sleeping too little. Second is going outside. Uh, get that sunlight. Feel a little better by getting some vitamin D and, and ultimately you'll you'll improve your mood that way as well. And then again, exercise. The more you move, the better you're going to feel. Social connection is also super important. We need to uh, connect with our community, our loved ones, our family, our friends, whomever. When we connect, we're going to feel closer to people. We're going to feel supported and we're going to feel better. And then finally, eating healthy. When you eat healthy, you're going to feel healthy. And when you feel healthy, you're going to feel good. So pay attention to eating a well-balanced diet. Pay attention to eating whole foods, you know, minimal processed foods. Avoid the sugars. Avoid the fast foods and you'll feel a lot better that way. Hopefully you found this to be helpful. Um, Hopefully this was a pretty good first episode. Um, I'm excited to see where this takes us, and and hopefully you'll want to come back and and hear some more. Uh, If you want to uh, connect with me, you can find me on social media. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. Um, I have a website too, Um, something I didn't mention. So I run my own private practice, uh, and I'm located in Pocatello, Idaho. Uh, my practice is called Ridgeline Counseling. So if you want to go to my website, and I'll have it connected here too with this episode, but it's uh, www.ridgelinecounselingid.com. Uh, you can go there and see some of my blog posts and, and just kind of see what I'm all about. And uh, feel free to shoot me an email or uh, send me a message and we can connect and hopefully uh, come back for uh, more mental health tips.